Sorry if I had many updates for you lately. The truck transmission job is moving along. Uh, I'm working from indoors today. You can see this is my home office in my basement that I've been slowly working on. I've been trying to make more progress on this. But uh, the truck transmission is almost done and I'll have an update video for you on that. Today I'm going to talk to you about electric trucks and why I think your next truck is going to be electric. And I'm not just talking about Tesla. Uh, there's some really interesting products happening out there and there's a lot of change in the automotive industry that I think is going to surprise all of us. And for those of you that are automotive enthusiasts like myself, you likely uh, have maybe looked at electric vehicles kind of curiously wondering if there's anything interesting there or if it's just going to kill automotive enthusiasm. And I don't think it will. And I'm going to show you why. Let's just take a high level view here of where we are today. Back in 2008, 2009, we are in an economic recession. Gas prices are astronomically high. We've got oil prices well above $100 a barrel. And uh, the, the general populace is faced with this idea that, you know, maybe having uh, petroleum based fuels for our transportation is unsustainable. At that time, supposedly Bob Lutz is credited with reinventing the idea of the electric vehicle and he says look we can we can come to market with something like the volt all the volt needs to do is achieve 30 miles of range because that is the average daily commute of an american which means that we don't have to build a fully electric vehicle we can just build a range extended electric vehicle and that was a pretty neat idea uh, that was sort of an older design philosophy because we were dealing with a thousand dollars a kilowatt hour for battery so as we were we were trying to design battery packs that were smaller and lower cost. And at that time, GM was working with LG with a pouch cell, and this is the battery architecture that they came up with. They came up with a uh, series of pouches that were in between aluminum plates that were water-cooled, and this was frankly a really, really clever design. They mastered the ability to keep those batteries cool. The cooling design of the Chevrolet Volt uh, first and second generation battery packs is, is far superior and it's one of the best on the market today. It still sets the precedent for what a, a pouch water-cooled pack should look like. However, there's a problem with this and that's that this is still designed around an architecture of what uh, a current uh, petroleum or diesel-based vehicle looks like. There's a transmission tunnel, there's a center uh, tunnel for the exhaust, and that's what they were designing around. They were trying to fit the battery packs into those areas. And frankly, you know, the center hump of a transmission or the exhaust tunnel or drive shaft tunnel really encroaches on the space of a car and it limits what you can do in there. It means that you have to have bucket seats. It means that you have to figure out ways to move your storage around and, and uh, uh, make compromises in your trunk. That's what GM was working with. And frankly, GM really revolutionized uh, transportation with the Volt because they showed that a plug-in hybrid could work and they actually sold it in significant volumes. And this is the second time that GM has done that. They've, they've come up with a, a usable mass market electric vehicle twice in the last two decades. Remember the EV1? The EV1 worked on nickel metal hydride batteries. And we all know what happened with that, but it's just astounding to think that GM has done this. They've basically been leaders in electric transportation, yet they don't hold the majority of the market share even today. I wonder why that is. If you look at the Bolt, which was, again, yet another uh, revolutionary vehicle, one of the first to reach mass market with 200 or more miles of range. But look at this car. It's a hatchback. Again, it looks like other cars. It's, it's nothing special here, and it's a small vehicle. The Volt, the EV1, and the Bolt are all competing in the small car segment. They're competing against $20,000 Honda Civics, and they cost a lot more than that. They put them in a $35,000 price segment, and look what you can get in the $35,000 price segment. You are looking to buy a BMW 3 Series, a Cadillac ATS, an Audi A4, or a Tesla Model 3. And look at these two here, the Nissan Leaf and the Chevrolet Bolt. 
they both look a little bit out of place when they are up against these other cars as their competitors. These are performance sedans and the Bolt and the Leaf are not. The only reason that you're going to buy a Bolt or a Leaf is because you're techie. You're an early adopter and you just like what it stands for. But it's not a sexy car. It's not a prestigious looking car. It's not an interesting looking car. I think what GM did when they made the Bolt was that they benchmarked their competition in the Nissan Leaf and they completely missed the idea of the performance sedan segment. Obviously, that was not lost on Tesla. Look at what you can do when you completely reformat the architecture of a vehicle, taking advantage of the space efficiency that a electric vehicle will give you. GM, I think they've, they've missed a number of opportunities. I've, I, don't, I haven't told most people on this channel what I do for a living. I'm a consultant. I have a PhD in physics. I have been testing and benchmarking performance of lithium ion batteries for over a decade. I'm vice chair for New York Best in the state of New York. New York Best is a trade, trade organization. It stands for New York Battery Energy Storage Technology Consortium. Uh, I've also served in the past as president and chairman of NATBAT, uh, the National Alliance for Advanced Technology Batteries. I've been in batteries for a long time. and. Uh, most of my activity is around stationary energy storage. I lead the stationary energy storage business for a large renewable energy consultancy company. So this is near and dear to my heart. And obviously, if you know me from this channel, you know that I care about transportation. That's something that I really like in my hobby. So this is really interesting to me because this is where my hobby and my professional life overlap. And so I'm really intrigued to see what's coming in the market here in electrification. One thing that some of these new platforms have been able to do is they've been able to completely eliminate, obviously, the engine. There's no transmission and there's no center tunnel for a drive shaft or exhaust. So when you eliminate those things, suddenly you open up the vehicle to uh, dozens of cubic feet of, of more storage space. So when you have dozens of cubic feet of more storage space or dozens of cubic feet of more latitude in which to, to build your design, you can do a lot of really novel things like move the seating around, uh, offer more compartments for storage, for equipment and, and long items, and also uh, start to look at things like flat load floors and ability to haul cargo. Something else that's really unique in a lot of the electric platforms is that they've got independent front and rear suspension. So you have independent front and rear suspension, you've got independent motors in the front and rear, and in Rivian's case, they've got independent motors for every wheel, which offers a lot of capability and traction control. And uh, you've got a low center of gravity and in a truck, that's gonna be really interesting. It's gonna decrease probability of rollover. It's gonna increase stability of the vehicle. And you have all your torque at zero to one RPM. And that's really important for towing and hauling. And that's why I think trucks, electric trucks, is really where we're, we're gonna see probably the most significant disruption of the automotive sector, even more so than vehicles, just cars. Tesla with the Model S really showed us that you can have a performance sedan, not necessarily at a reasonable price, but with great performance and a very classy looking vehicle, a vehicle that people want to buy. And they've showed us that again with the Model 3. The Model 3 is competing in an even different uh, car segment, the $35,000 car segment and up. And uh, that's made it much more accessible to the general population. And so I think, in the US anyway, we love our trucks, we love our SUVs. And if there's disruption in that where you can take all these value propositions and put them into a car, you're really gonna see things change and you're gonna see them change quickly. Think about what you can do with traction control in an electric vehicle. Tesla's already doing this, where at least between the front and rear uh, wheels, uh, they can have variable traction control, they can have variable torque and power in the front and rear, depending on stability and conditions. And look at the difference between this elegant, compact, clean design from Tesla skateboard versus Acura, which Acura is one of the most interesting and, and best designed uh, torque vectoring capable all wheel drive systems in the market. Acura did all this with a transverse mounted front wheel drive platform and they could, they could push 
more than 50% of the engine power to either of the rear wheels, which is incredible to be able to do that on a basically what looks like a front wheel drive platform. But look at the complexity. You've got a lot of viscous coupling devices. You've got hydraulic fluid that you have to move around. Really inefficient. Uh, a lot of convoluted mechanical devices to make it work. Acura did it very elegantly and they did it affordably. Well, you can do away with all that complexity and do away with the engine and do that with electric vehicles much more simply. And so uh, I think we're gonna see that happen. Comparing sort of the drive lines against two benchmarks here, look at the Tesla Model 3. I wanna talk to you about power density. 271 horsepower in that little rear mo motor there from the Model 3. And look at sort of the same thing, the Cadillac ATS, which is a 275 horsepower turbocharged engine. Really complex engine, by the way. Highly boosted, direct injection, really complex in order to get that power range. So you've got this big engine in the front, and then you've got uh, independent rear suspension in the rear. I drive a Cadillac ATS. I love that chassis. That car is so stable and turns. If it naturally wants to drift, it's a very neutral handling car. It's a great car, but it's got a lot of complexity for the same amount of power that you would get in a Model 3. The Model 3 is much simpler. This simplicity translates directly to cost. And you're already seeing this when they talk about uh, Model 3 production in Tesla and their margin. Tesla is demonstrating that they have a lot more room for margin because they've got a lot more simplicity in their architecture. And as they scale, their margin is going to increase even more. Basically, what they are doing is they are converting car manufacturing from a very mechanical hardware intensive uh, kind of process to something that looks a lot more like electronics, which is you have a hardware platform and then you do all the innovation with the software. And that's what Tesla is starting to do. That leads to much greater scale and therefore much better margin. So most of the rest of this presentation is going to be about comparing Rivian versus Bollinger. And I want you to know some things about both of these companies. Rivian has supposedly been a startup that's been in stealth mode for the last 10 years. They used to have a website where they talked about their specs, but their specs were pretty high level. They have a manufacturing plant now in Illinois, and they are very well funded, and their investors have been very patient. What they just launched in the last two weeks was the Rivian R1S and R1T, the S being the SUV and the T being the truck. They are close to production because they've already solidified things like their skateboard design like I showed earlier, their battery module architecture, their supply agreements with battery manufacturers. So supposedly this is the real deal. They think that they're going to come out and start producing. Bollinger, started by Robert Bollinger in upstate New York, is a really interesting company. You can look at this vehicle. It looks like a uh, kind of an international scout or, or a Ford Bronco from the 70s. Very squarish, very rugged looking design. Really, really interesting truck. It's a class three truck, which means it has a 10,000 pound gross vehicle weight rating, which has some implications for Bollinger. Bollinger just also moved into a production facility. They've been prototyping and testing a couple mules for a while. In my role at New York Best, I met Robert Bollinger. He came and gave a presentation at one of our conferences about a year and a half ago. Uh, we briefly chatted after his presentation. I was very, very, very compelled by his business model and that he tried to make a simple to build, reliable truck that could be used for very practical applications. He had a, a large ranch with a lot of acreage in, in upstate New York and he wanted a ranch truck. He wanted something that he could, you know, drive around his land and, you know, install fences and, uh, you know, having all the off-road capability and, and power accessories and things like that that a truck should give. And... Therefore, he's made a very rugged, very interesting truck. So the two of these are sort of going after the same market, but they have very different features. So Bollinger has expanded the B1 to the B2, which is the more pickup truck looking chassis. And then here's the Rivian R1T. You can see there's some differences between the two. The R1T looks kind of like a Toyota Tacoma. And for whatever re reason, Rivian has chosen to use uh, adventuring as part of their marketing. They are saying that uh, they have adventure vehicles. And I think what they're really trying to emphasize is that they have long range. And so they're trying to get over the uh, immediate perception of range anxiety for some people and saying, look, you know, we have long range in these trucks. You can, you can take them anywhere. Frankly, I think it's a little bit distracting from their brand. If they've just made a really nice truck, they should just market it that way. And uh, they don't need to call it an adventure vehicle or not. Regardless, they're going to be very capable with all-wheel drive and, and the ability to um, 
drive anywhere. Meanwhile, you've got these two really interesting startups that I think have a pretty good chance of succeeding if they do things right, especially since GM has said they have no intentions of building an electric truck. Now, what the heck is the matter with these guys? I just don't understand how they could revolutionize the automotive industry with electric transportation twice, then completely drop the ball and completely miss this market. If they wanted to, GM has the best battery lab, in my opinion, on the planet. I've been there twice. It is astounding. They have thousands of channels where they can test and cycle batteries. They've got some of the best battery architecture design that's been proven in the Bolt and the Volt. They can test and build a battery system. They can make their own battery system. They can predict the remaining life of a battery system. They've got some of the best battery engineers on the planet. Why the hell are they missing this market? It's the most lucrative. There's a lot more profit margin in trucks. They've already played around. They've already offered their truck platforms to other companies like Workhorse and Via Motors, which I'll show you in a minute. They've got plenty of capability if they wanted to pursue this market. Yet they're saying, nah, these other guys can have it. I think they're completely missing an opportunity here and really setting themselves up for their own disruption. It's really unfortunate to see that happen. There are some other electric trucks out there. Here we've got the Havlar Bison, which to me looks like uh, somebody uh, started playing around with fiberglass and they modified a Chevy S10 in their garage and they took it to a car show. Um, it's kind of a cool design. I don't know, it could be interesting. And then here's Workhorse, which is obviously sort of a rebranded uh, Chevrolet Silverado. Workhorse is an Ohio company. I'm rooting for them. I really hope that they succeed, but they're really working with a 10 year old design. They're working again with a series hybrid architecture, kind of like the Chevrolet Volt. You got a range extender, you got your batteries in the, in the frame, and then you've got uh, the ability to operate fully electric and drive around fully electric, but you're also relying a little bit on gasoline. One thing that is kind of unique is they have an independent rear suspension. I think if they market this right, you know, uh, sort of in two markets, they want to make a, a truck that you or I can buy, but they also want to market it towards truck fleets. So if they sell this in say like a body and white or a cabin chassis uh, kind of configuration to, to companies like FedEx or UPS or something like that, then there's definitely a value proposition there. 10 years ago, I did a pa I published a paper in Energy Policy where I looked at the Via Motors platform as, as sort of the basic uh, cabin chassis uh, configuration that you could sell to fleets like say UPS. And the fuel savings was incredible. You could pay for the fleet in two to three years easily. And that was at those prices. Today, they, the battery prices are a 10th of what they were 10 years ago. So I don't see any reason why this couldn't succeed if marketed appropriately. I mentioned Via Motors. That's what Bob Lutz is doing now. Again, he's basically rebranding uh, Chevrolet pickups. It's the same kind of architecture as Workhorse. It's a series parallel configuration, typically anywhere from 30 to say 50 kilowatt hours of batteries in the back that makes the truck electric drive. And then it's powered by, you know, either a V6 or like a turbo four cylinder uh, engine in the front. I like Bob Lutz. I've read a lot of Bob Lutz's books. I respect him. I know that he disrupted GM from the inside out when he was making the Volt and he did a few other really cool things in his career. Not just a few. He did a lot of cool things in his career. Uh, he's made some silly predictions. He has made some really interesting predictions. I think that he's right on when he says that EVs are critical to the future of transportation. I think there's no doubt of that now. Uh, and he also said that autonomous cars are the way of the future. So it'll be interesting to see how that comes out. Uh, I travel a lot for work. I've seen uh, self-driving cars, I've ridden in a self-driving Tesla, and I think that's really fascinating, and, and I certainly do think that that is going to change the way that we drive. Um, it's only a matter of time before we hail an Uber and it shows up without a driver. And that's one thing that uh, Bob Lutz is also predicting. He said that Tesla's heading for the graveyard. He was completely wrong by that. He also said that Tesla has no competitive advantage and he's dead wrong in that. If you look at what Tesla is doing, they really actually do have very clever battery design. They've got a way to scale their manufacturing. They have, they have hit the nail on the head when it comes to design and a sexy car. They have, they've built and designed cars that people want. Uh, they have built desirable cars and, and GM has completely missed the mark on that. And frankly, uh, I think Bob is, is, has been drinking too much of the GM Kool-Aid and he completely missed that point too. However, Bob has said that maybe all car brands will disappear in the future. And he said that maybe individual driving of cars will be future banned, which I think is really sad to think about. I like driving cars, as you know, um, 
but that's something to think about. What would that mean? If you can really show that accident rates are reduced through autonomous driving, which is certainly not the case right now, but someday it very well could be, yeah, maybe you would ban driving or you just have such high insurance rates on people that want to drive their own cars that it makes it cost prohibitive to do so. Here's another interesting truck from Atlas. Now this one is all concept. I don't see any real production capability from Atlas yet, but they're claiming three to 500 miles of range. I'm not sure if this is a typo, but it says 35,000 pounds towing. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. A front trunk, a dually option, and zero to 60 in five seconds. I think zero to 60 is completely possible. Obviously nothing preventing somebody from doing a dually or a front trunk. The 35,000 pound towing seems ridiculous to me. Okay, yeah, 10,000 pounds is certainly possible. Uh, 15,000 pounds maybe. Um, the 300 to 500 miles range, again, that's going to depend entirely on the battery pack and what kind of pricing and cost they can get in those. So right here, you're looking at at least a $60,000 truck and up, depending on how much volume and scale they get. Let's see whether or not they succeed. Back to Rivian. Again, it seemed like a lot of people were comparing it to the Toyota Tacoma, which is a mid-sized truck. But when you looked at the prototype pictures of Rivian, they had taken their skateboard chassis and they basically plopped a Ford F-150 on top of it. So it looks like it's a full-size truck, but if they're marketing as a mid-size truck, I think they're gonna have some challenges. Number one being, if you have a full-size truck, you wanna be able to do stuff like put plywood and drywall on the back. And that's definitely something that Bullinger has acknowledged. That's the only reason I own a full-size truck. Otherwise, I wouldn't mind driving a mid-size truck around. But I like a full-size truck because, as you know, I'm a woodworker. I like to go get plywood from the store. Occasionally, I'm doing home remodeling projects. It's nice to be able to go get some drywall. I also like to do this with my truck. I like to get some mulch. I like to get some gravel. I like to get some stones if I want to build a stone walkway. Those are things that I like to do. That's usually why people like to have trucks. In a truck, especially if you've got a rear seat, I could go pick up my kids from school and swing by the hardware store and get a sheet of plywood on my way home. That's what makes trucks amazing. And I think that if you're going to make an electric truck, you have to acknowledge that and be able to give it that capability. I assure you that Tesla's thinking of that in their truck. But you've seen what I like to do in my trucks. I like to haul my engines around. I like to haul plywood around. I have car parts like getting my transmission out of the truck. I, like, I want my truck to be functional. And I think that's absolutely a requirement of any truck that's coming into the market. Here's some really cool things about the Bollinger B1 and these some of these features carry over to the Bollinger B2 that I think are really important to look at. First of all, check this out. They've got a front pass through they have a frunk with its own front tailgate and then they got the real rear tailgate and you can fit a 12 foot long piece of lumber from front to rear with both tailgates closed that's just really awesome and the only reason you can do that is because there's no engine and it's a really clever design um, they can fit something like 40 pieces of 12 foot long 2x4s in there Something else that's pretty clever is look at these seats. This looks kind of like the uh, Honda Element, if you remember that car. I always thought that was a cool idea on the Honda Element that you could do that. And so they're doing that here too. And I think what that means is even when they're folded down, there's nothing uh, touching the floor from the bottom of the seat, which I hope means you could actually slide a couple sheets of plywood underneath the seats, which is what something I would want to do. If I went to the store and uh, I got some plywood and I have my kids in the back. Obviously, I can't fold my kids up against the window. <laughs> so, you know, I hope you could still use it for something like that. Something else that's cool is check out the auxiliary power. You know, obviously, super useful if you're camping or you're out working in a remote area. But one thing I don't really like is look at these little wheel humps. It looks like these are going over the electric motors. Really, guys, couldn't you just move the electric motors down a couple inches? I don't see why this low floor is not flat. And I hope that that's something that they correct in the production vehicle. Check out these specs. So they have an aluminum body. Think about how much of a big deal Ford has made about an aluminum body. They did that to save weight in order to get better fuel economy, but frankly, Ford, GM, and Dodge have not made much significant advancements in fuel economy in the truck segment over the last decade. Uh, but they have an aluminum body, and the reason why they have an aluminum body is to save weight. But also, one reason that they did it this way, and this is something that Robert Bollinger talked about extensively in his presentation to New York Best when I saw him, and that's that he was looking for ease of manufacturing. He wasn't sure if they were going to be building this truck at his ranch in upstate New York or if they were going to go buy a factory somewhere. 
turns out that they've actually gone and they're at least leasing some manufacturing space in Michigan. But he wanted ease of manufacturing. There's not a lot of compound curves in this truck. Everything is just a piece of metal that can be stamped and possibly riveted together. And that's really what he was looking for was ease of manufacturing and low cost. Dual motors, so front and rear, all wheel drive. One thing that's really cool about this is it's got portal wheel hubs. What that means is the rotational center of the wheels is actually below the axle. The only other vehicle I can think of that has that is the Hummer. Um, you can see that in a lot of off-road trucks. They have portal um, hubs. And the whole point of that is to lift up the center of the driveline uh, to give it more ground clearance. And so they have 15 inches of ground clearance. So this is a pretty capable off-road vehicle. A 4,800 pound curb weight. And again, I mentioned it's a class three vehicle, which gives it 10,000 pounds of gross vehicle weight rating, which means take 10,000 minus 4,800, you get something like 5,200 pounds of payload capacity. That's pretty astounding. You could stack a lot of plywood in that, in that truck. The class three, I think, affords Bullinger or something else, which is a little bit less stringent safety standards. So you can notice, like if you look at the dashboard, they don't have airbags. Um, that's kind of smart you know if they're coming forward in the market and they're they're going after a class 3 category then they're marketing to a different kind of driver and uh, that that's going to speed up their development process because they don't have to go through as rigorous crash safety testing and things like that 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds 614 horsepower and 668 pound-feet of torque that is astounding performance I can't think of any vehicle any truck segment today that gives you that kind of performance right off the dealer lot and that's pretty pretty amazing stuff and again all that torque is available from a dead stop so that's pretty cool 120 kilowatt hour battery leads to approximately a 200 mile range obviously this truck does not have a great drag coefficient so its range is going to suffer also there's some inefficiency in that drivetrain through those portal hubs but uh so 200 miles is a little low compared to what a lot of other vehicles can give you today, but I'm sure they'll find ways around that. Battery energy densities are only improving. 49 inch bed width, that's near and dear to my heart. That means you can haul four by eight sheets of whatever. The price is targeted between 60 and $100,000. And I think there are two things that swing that price. Number one is how much battery do you want? So you're gonna get a long range option or are you gonna get the low uh, range option? And also, how much volume can they scale? Um, they're gonna take their assessment from their pre-orders and see how many they can get, and that's probably when their pricing will officially come out. It's supposed to come into the market starting manufacturing next year, 2019. You can see that it looks a lot like an International Scout or a Range Rover Defender or a Ford Bronco, and I think that's pretty cool, I like that. Compare that to the Rivian. The Rivian can have up to 180 kilowatt hours of battery, which would give it its full 400 mile range. The low end is 105 kilowatt hours, which is a 230 mile range. 147 kilowatts per wheel. I don't know why they didn't translate these to uh, English units that most of their American market would understand, but that means 197 horsepower per wheel or total 788 horsepower. That is Dodge Hellcat territory. That is pretty astounding for a truck. That gives it a zero to 60 time of three seconds in the higher energy range for the battery pack or 4.9 seconds for the lower range. Still pretty damn fast for a truck. 2,670 kilogram curb weight, which is 5,886 pounds. Just for reference, a Chevy Silverado has a 4,200 to 5,100 pound curb weight. So this is a heavy truck. And the reason why is because it's the battery. If you just nominally assume 150 watt hours per kilogram of battery cells, not counting the rest of balance of plant of the modules and packs, you're looking at about 1200 kilograms or 2,640 pounds in batteries. So that's where most of the weight comes from. Obviously you've eliminated the engine and the transmission, but you've added the weight back in with the battery cells. Their target price is $69,000. That's probably starting Remember the Model 3 at $35,000? We still haven't seen it. But frankly, you never see any vehicle that uh, actually sells in its greatest volume at its entry level price. By the time you option up vehicles, they get pretty expensive. One distinction between Bollinger and Rivian is that Bollinger will not have autonomous driving and Rivian thinks that they will have fully autonomous driving. A bit surprising to me, it's hard enough to build a truck and scale it up for manufacturing, but that's a whole layer of software 
to do autonomous driving and I'm just not sure if Rivian's really going to be able to come to market right away with that. But they think that they can. Are these guys going to succeed? I mean, we've got a lot of examples of car companies not succeeding like Faraday Future, Lucid Air, and Fisker. I think some of the differences about those companies versus Rivian and Bollinger is that those companies, the, the Fiskers and Lucid Airs and, and uh, Faraday Future, spent a lot of time on marketing and talking the car up, but they didn't really show a lot of hardware. They didn't show a lot of manufacturing. They didn't show... Um, you know, built vehicles out there being tested and driving around. And Rivian and Bollinger have shown both. Uh, Rivian supposedly has spent all their time on focusing on the manufacturing before they went out and started talking to the world about it. And so did Bollinger. Bollinger had built a couple uh, test mules and, and were driving around and they learned a lot from it. And if you pay attention to what they post on Instagram and other social media, um, it's very clear that they've been learning from those vehicles and they've been running them through their paces. People have criticized Rivian and other car companies for, you know, they're not going to succeed because they don't have the charging network that Tesla does. Hey, there's a lot more charging infrastructure out there than Tesla. Uh, I'm, I'm using ChargePoint as, as an example here. Uh, I know Pasquale Romano from ChargePoint. He's a really engaging guy. Uh, you can buy a ChargePoint charger off Amazon for 600 bucks. You can see that they've got quite a, uh, an in-depth charging network across the United States. And then there's other companies out there besides ChargePoint. There's Fleet Karma, there's EV Box, and of course there's Tesla. So don't worry, you're going to be able to charge your car. And worst case, you charge it at work or you charge it at home. So don't worry about it. I've also heard people criticize that these performance numbers for Rivian and Bollinger, you know, are, you know, why would you want a fast truck? And I, that doesn't make any sense to me. If you're an automotive enthusiast, you'll never complain about having something that's too fast. So... I think that's a stupid argument, and the people making that argument just obviously are not car people. I don't understand where they're coming from. Again, pricing. I think really if they can get into the fifty to sixty-five thousand dollar price range, neither car has really gotten in there. One thing Rivian made the mistake of doing was when they talked about their introductory pricing, they included their price. They 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 stated their price with the tax credit in, included. So the sixty-nine thousand dollars minus seventy-five hundred bucks put it in the 61.5 area, which I think is dumb. Just you're misleading buyers, don't do that. Just just say, look, here's the price. And oh, by the way, if you want a tax credit, you might be able to get one. I think that's a better way to go. If they can really get it down in the 50 to $65,000 range, which I think is completely achievable. And like I said, if GM would just commit themselves, they could do that. Because they've got the, the pricing, they've got the leverage, they've got the supply chains already established. They already know how to build trucks. If they can, take their chassis, take their frames from the Silverado, delete all the rest of the drivetrain, cut all the, the bars out from the middle of the chassis and start from scratch, I bet you they could build you a $55,000 to $60,000 electric truck, but they won't. I just wanna point out that a Sierra starts at $37,800, but look at this, as shown, $60,810. So you can almost double the price of the truck by the time you option it out, and it's no different for EVs. So despite the fact that Rivian is saying they're gonna start at $69,000, I would imagine if they reach production and they start selling them, most of them will be well above that. And it might very well be the case for Bollinger as well. They're probably also going to take another page out of Elon Musk's book, which is sell the more expensive ones first so that you can demonstrate growth and demand and better margin and then start to cut back as you optimize your manufacturing and start offering the sort of bare bones models, which they might do. So even though we're excited about these guys showing us production in 2019 and 2020, it might be a while before we start to see trucks in this price range. But when they do get in that range, I predict complete and total disruption. They're just gonna be better in every way. And here's why. You've got equal or better payload. You've got equal or even maybe much better towing if you believe what Atlas is saying. Let's just say equal for now. You got better ride and handling for sure. You got better traction control. Way, way more speed. More in-cab storage with a frunk. And one thing I didn't show is Rivian's got this kind of clever little storage compartment under the rear seats. I don't know why they made that. They could have just made a deeper bed if they wanted to. But anyway, it's kind of cool. You could put a snowboard in there. You've got superior low end torque, better ways to accommodate cargo, more power. You've got the ability for electric accessories like a 110 volt outlets and USB chargers and things like that. Lower center of gravity, which is really important for a truck. 
It means it's not going to tip over or roll over and it's going to feel much more stable going around turns at high speed, like when you're coming around an off-ramp or an on-ramp. And all this comes with better efficiency. Like I said, you can see what GM has tried to do. Their newest Silverado has a turbo four-cylinder in it. And they did that to achieve better fuel economy, but it's already showing in the real world that it just can't do it. It's too small of an engine for too big of a vehicle. And I think that we've plateaued in terms of what's the ultimate efficiency that you can achieve in a truck. You've, you've already done stuff with Ford where you've got aluminum body panels. We've downsized all the engines. We, we invested in direct injection and it's just not getting us there. You're never going to have a 30 mile per gallon pickup. But with an electric truck, you've got something that's going to have basically a hundred miles per gallon equivalent. And that's really where you're gonna completely change the way that the US market pays for and understands the cost of transportation. If you look at vehicle miles traveled annually, most of the vehicle miles traveled occur with trucks. If you drive around during the week, during the day, on a weekday, and you drive around your local town, Chances are most of the traffic that you're going to see on the local roads and highways are trucks. It's because trucks are moving our produce. Trucks are, are where the construction uh, workers are moving their equipment around with. You're going to see landscapers out on the road. You're going to see trash trucks. You're going to see commercial trucks. You're going to see all kinds of shipping and transportation and logistics happening right before your eyes. And that's all trucks. So if we can disrupt that part of our transportation network with electric vehicles and now we're seeing that it's absolutely technically achievable and very well might be financially achievable then basically we are done with Saudi Arabia and everybody else and whether you think that that's valuable or or you're looking for some secret to energy independence well I think that's it so we're gonna see a complete change in how we are managing our transportation infrastructure once we start to see affordable, reasonable electric trucks that people actually want. And I think Rivian and Bollinger have made one. They've made something that I want. And I think if you're an automotive enthusiast, you watch my channel, you probably want it too. There's something really cool about that. And it's just too bad that GM is missing the boat and uh, maybe Ford and Dodge are too. But this is what, this is what disruption looks like. And we're going to see a big change in the way we look at fuel and energy. Uh, and it's going to come really fast. So thanks for watching. This is Davian Hill with Solve Fix Build. Stay real.